What's up, uh, internet, YouTube, or from wherever you uh, are watching this? This is another uh, old book I found uh, that I forgot I had. This is a uh, old uh, book or article that uh, Terry Farrell did, and this is a uh, TV guide that Terry Farrell did from uh, 1984 in October and there is a uh, interview or article that Terry did that's in this thing and uh, from way back and uh, I actually thought it was kind of weird or hard to believe that this was that this is a uh, picture of uh, Terry or Terry Farrell but apparently on this cover this is a uh, picture of Terry Farrell I guess you know this is from so far back this is you know from way back about uh, I don't know 30 years ago or whatever or something like that and uh, yeah, I thought this was kind of hard to believe that this was uh, Terry because of the uh, hairstyle. I, I guess, you know, they did things a little bit differently back then. Because, I mean, the hairstyle is just like poof or whatever. Anyway, so before I start reading this thing, I don't think I, uh, I ever was on here or on one of these. Uh, I don't think I thanked uh, Terry Farrell for uh, all the movies, all the pictures, all the magazines, all the uh, interviews or articles or advertisements, uh, TV shows, radio shows, movie shows, and movies and, and, and all the other stuff. So yeah, I just wanted to put that out there. And uh, yeah, this is from way back see here yeah things were a little bit different back then <laughs> 1984 car commercial and there was a bunch of stuff in here I thought was kind of cool so all right so the article we're looking for is Terry Farrell of Paper Dolls and this is on page 12 yeah I was looking through this thing and I thought it was uh, pretty cool it has some pretty cool stuff in this thing cigarette commercial some uh, some more 80's commercials here Oh. Yeah. Oh. And this is another picture of Terry Farrell wearing a Iowa uh, University t-shirt, I think that was, or something. Anyway, so... This is titled, I Didn't Seem to Fit In Anywhere. That's how Terry Farrell felt in her Iowa hometown. But she's quite at home now with the glamour of Hollywood and her enjoying role in Paper Dolls. Oh yeah, this is way back, people. This is, uh... Haha. <laughs> yeah. Now this is... Oh yeah, whoa. This is a really kind of a big article. So I think, or well, I'm probably gonna have to do this in uh, maybe a second part to read all of this. And uh, yeah, there's a lot of stuff to cover here, a lot of stuff to read. So I will just uh, start reading this then. It says here. Terry Farrell, 20, 
Oh yeah, way, way, way back. Terry Farrell 20, the girl with the mile high cheekbones, melting eyes, and that earnest, I'm really serious when I tell you this look on her face, flashes her most <clears throat> electric, crispy, brinkly smile, the one she can turn on and off like a faucet, orders a chef's salad, hold the meat, and all the rest of that yucky stuff and explains in breathless detail how she happened to leave her home in Cedar Rapids, Iowa three years ago to become she promised her classmates at George Washington Senior High School a high fashion model in New York a place she had seen only in the movies and now she's a star of ABC's new series Paper Dolls nice little city Cedar Rapids, neat, compact, kind of town you could walk down the street, say hi to people, and feel perfectly safe, she is saying. I love my family, and I'm glad I grew up there. But people dream about going to New York or Hollywood because it's glamorous. You are a picture in a magazine and all. Everybody can see you. The smile again. Cedar Rapids is more for moving away from. So Teresa Lee Farrell Gusendorf, her friends call her Farrell, age 15, lost no time in acting on that conviction. Let her sister Chris and her three stepsisters and her thrice married mother Kay and her adored stepfather Dave stay home and tend the knitting. Didn't Dave, the data systems analyst, call her the star almost from the first moment he saw her? Hadn't her natural father, Edwin Farrell Jr., the one who went away to California and never came back, once been an actor in community theater? If she had a nickel for every time somebody suggested she be a model or something, she would have been the richest kid on the block. It was very confusing, she muses. I was six feet tall and the biggest kid on the basketball team. I didn't seem to fit in anywhere. I didn't know what happened to my father. I only knew I was supposed to look like him. The family kept changing like you were going through a revolving door. It wasn't easy having three stepsisters to get attention. I dr <laughs> to get attention, I dramatized everything. With me, washing dis dishes was a real production. So I decided to become a famous movie star. She started entering everything in sight. She competed in Miss Teenage Iowa and was named most photogenic at the state pageant. She modeled for Armstrong's department store. She appeared in a regional ad in Seventeen magazine. She started boning up on New York modeling agencies and where to send your picture and how to make people notice you. She kept shipping out those glamour pictures, mostly amateur and mostly murky. When she did get something halfway decent, it was likely to have been shot by a man whose forte was photographing tractors. But the stuff kept bouncing back. They said I was too young, too tall, not pretty enough, eyes too small. It was very aggravating. Then, one day, Gera Morse called from Elite a modeling agency in New York. If you're anything like your picture, she told me, we'll hire you. I started to cry. Oddly enough, Morse, who says she acted on gut feeling, flew to Iowa to see the prospect instead of the other way around. I've only done that a couple of times. But this was one I had to find out about, she claims. Too tall? Maybe. But I also sensed something fresh and magnetic there. The Cedar Rapids Summit occurred over breakfast on a summer day in 1980 at the new Stouffer downtown. Terry, in mortal fear of rejection, wore an Oxford button-down shirt, dark brown tie, and little vest, and looked, she decided, <laughs> really dumb. Kay in Summer Cottons played her role of reassuring mother. 
Morse found the Grusendorfs rather more sophisticated than I had expected. Terry was teary-eyed but willing and really grateful, no smugness there and never trying to be anything except what she really was. Mother? Well, she asked all the right questions a concerned mother should ask. As for Farrell, I remember nibbling on my toast and thinking, well, anyway, my teeth are straight. Then when Gara said, I hope you like New York, I turned into one big goosebump. I went home, I jumped on my bed, I didn't eat, I didn't sleep, it simply blew me away. Theoretically, she was supposed to finish George Washington High before doing anything else. Anything else. But it appears neither Farrell nor Elite had the patience. She went east for test shots at Christmas with Kay, then alone the following summer on a temporary basis just to see how it went. It went swimmingly. The first day she was sent over to Mademoiselle magazine to fill on to fill in on a fitting for another model. She so impressed the editors that six weeks later she had her first uh, cover. In Manhattan she lived with five other models all more experienced than she was in an apartment ma maintained by elite. Not only did this arrangement offer a certain amount of protection but it served to broaden her knowledge of clothes grooming and the ways of the world generally when she couldn't learn <clears throat> what she couldn't learn in acting and dance class she picked up simply by being around the others for the big questions she depended on Davion Littlefield of J. Michael Bloom her agent and friend who guarded her like a lioness with a favored cub they met shortly after Farrell's arrival she was sitting in the agency looking sad and nursing a fat lip where some kid had run into her with a bicycle. Littlefield recalls, there was something about her that made me want to make sure she met the right people. The report was immediate. We talked by telephone every day, Farrell says. She was always telling me who the good guys and who the bad guys were. It says here, when Gara said, I hope you like New York, I turned into one big goose bump. I didn't eat, I didn't sleep, it simply blew me away. Oh. Still, there are some profoundly mystifying aspects of big city life. I still can't figure out, she sighs, who's gay and who isn't. Which was all very well, except that to Farrell's way of thinking, it was not doing anything to transform her into the famous movie star she had decided she was going to be. She was growing impatient after being gorgeous on 40 magazine covers. Modeling was losing some of its edge. There was, she discovered, a bone-crunching amount of work of being beautiful on call. The glamorous life all too often consisted of coming home after a 12-hour day tossing your hat box into a corner and falling into bed exhausted. Fortunately, there were other important folk whose attention she had attracted. Producers Leonard Goldberg and my and Michelle Report had had a big rating success with a glitzy TV movie called Paper Dolls about big time modeling. Originally it had a simple storyline. The reigning cover girl finds herself being edged out of contention by a beautiful newcomer while voracious mama sieves. While ABC decided to convert it into a prime time soap in the manner of Dallas, Dynasty, and Falcon Crest, Paper Dolls acquired a lot of extra uh, baggage. A whole family of rich and powerful folk materialized. Conglomerates and subplots sprang up like weeds, and JR like scoundrels, and their victims abounded. When they weren't doing in their business rivals, they were leading the good life on their horsey Long Island estates and buying their daughters $100,000 diamond and ruby necklaces as birthday presents. Okay, so this is a, another long Terry article or interview, and I will continue this reading this in the next part. So, see you later.